the feeling started uh, probably when I was a kid. I, I didn't notice it really uh, un, until probably high school. Now my memory is a little bit shoddy. I don't remember a lot of things in my in my past, but I I, I remember the feeling pretty pretty distinctly. Um, in in high school is when it really started to kick into a high gear. It was probably always a part of me. It's probably always been there, but high school is when I really started to notice this feeling that I had. And it was this feeling, this desire to always want to be liked by everyone around me. I, I I don't know what it was. I I I just I just wanted everyone to like me. And and being an introvert, that's weird because you know I I don't really like being around people all that much. Uh, but I I still wanted people to have a high opinion of me. And so uh, I started noticing in high school that I had a lot of friends, but I didn't have a lot of close friends. There were people who who I was friendly with, but there weren't a lot of friend people that I had. I mean, I, I, and I, and, and, and I can have a revisionist history for sure. I know that there were three dudes in my life that were all older than me, uh, that were incredibly, incredibly important to, um, my, my well-being, my, um, my social life, and also my spiritual life. These guys, uh, poured into me and I would like to think that I poured into them as well, but I know for a fact that they poured into me and, but but I but I wasn't satisfied. It, it wasn't enough. I I was I would go to high school and I would be friends with everyone, but not really close with anyone. At least in my grade. I mean, I all I wanted was to be invited to to hang out at at that person's house or or be invited to that party. Not that I was that type of a guy. I just I just didn't know what it was like to to be that. And and I always thought that there was something wrong with me. And then and, and then I met my wife and you know, I didn't really care too much about friends anymore at that point, but um I was hoping maybe that that my my wife would fulfill every need that I had and wanted. And guess what? Um she didn't. She doesn't because she's not Jesus. And uh so I I put so much expectation on being married that everything in life was then going to make sense. Like I was one of those kids that um, I didn't want the rapture to happen until I got married. Like I wanted to get married, have kids, you know what I mean? And that was, that. It, then, then Jesus could come back. If only I do this, if just I get to that point, then I'll be happy. Um, and, and I keep seeing this play out in my life. If only I get to blank, then I'll be happy. If only those people like me. If only I'm in with that crowd. If only I'm here. And that's kind of gone with me. And then on the contrary, it's like, ah, I'm not there because of something I'm doing. I'm not invited to that party because of who I am. I'm not invited to... Um, to, to do music at this church because there's something that's inadequate within me. And, and I took that into the very first church that I started leading worship at. My dad was an associate pastor at this church, small country church, and, and we needed to start a uh, quote-unquote contemporary service with, with drums and guitars and stuff. And so um, I helped start this second service that was a, a contemporary service, and I, and I wasn't satisfied there either. I assumed that... Um, you know, I wanted to please people. I wanted to make sure that they had um, a good experience on a Sunday morning. And I thought, unless the place was full, I wasn't doing a good job. And in my own viewpoint, it wasn't full. I wasn't doing a good job. There were people that were missing. Uh, and it wasn't growing like a megachurch might grow. And so I, I put that on myself and thought, you know what, if only I were better at this, if only I were good at this, if only, if only, if only. These if only statements kept plaguing me. And uh, then I finally started leading worship at a church. Um, it's, it carried me through until I finally was able to be on staff at a church. And then when I was on staff at a church, I was doing student ministries and I was doing worship. And, and uh, it, it got better, uh, but I was still just wanting to, to, to please people. I was finding my identity and how well a weekend service went. If the weekend service went well, if there weren't any hiccups, because I was over production, I was over worship, and... Um, yeah, and, and and so if if it didn't go well, then I uh, I felt that, and if the church didn't grow, um, then I. 
put that on my own shoulders, that this was my fault that the church isn't growing. I'm not doing a good enough job. People don't like me. Um, and it, and, 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 and again, I was desiring something that I didn't have. I was like, man, if only I just was able to speak more. If only I was able to do that. Originally, all I wanted to do was lead music. And then once I started leading music, it was like, man, I just need to, I just need to preach. Um, you know, always going for that next thing. And uh, with this church, I, I was awkward with people. I didn't know how to be around people. I didn't know, I just, I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, I, 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 I still had a hard time meeting people and talking with people and um, having awkward exchanges with people, and, and, but still just finding my identity in how people perceive the weekend to go. And I remember the pastor, my boss, sat me down one time in my office and we were chatting about stuff and he's like, dude, you've got to start finding your identity in Jesus and not in your abilities, not your gifting, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I know my identity is in Christ. Yada, yada. I, I grew up in church. I knew all the church talk. And, and yet still, I was finding my identity in people. And uh, fast forward to today um, or just several weeks ago. Um, I, 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 we started Restoration Church, not several weeks ago, but we started Restoration Church, and I thought, this is it. This is, this is where I'm content. This is where I'm going to be extremely satisfied, and this is where God has me. This is where he wants me. I don't need anything else in the world. And wouldn't you know, just a couple years later, I'm still wrestling with those same feelings. Worried more about what someone is going to think than, than am I preaching a true message. Worried more about um, how, how I'm perceived versus how is Jesus coming across here. And I've, and I've grown in that a little bit, but it's still a, a big, big problem for me. Some of you, uh, if you watch this and are, and are close by and, and call Restoration Church your home church, uh, you might have gotten a text message from me at one point on a Sunday afternoon just saying, hey, um, because I'm insecure about who I am based on how I did in the performance for that day. And I'm telling you all of these things uh, because just a few weeks ago, right before Easter, um, I, I, I just, I don't know how else to put it, but I went into a depression. Um, and that's not something that I usually do. I'm usually a pretty happy-go-lucky dude, but uh, I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to do anything, uh, and I was anxious, um, and, and a lot of things were going on. Uh, I was so afraid of people um, and letting people down that it was weighing on me every single day, and I was to a point where I was like, I don't, I just... I don't want to do anything anymore. Uh, I would be okay if I just preached the word somewhere and then left and never spoke to another person again. Just speak from stage and don't have any relationships. Um, but at the same time, I was missing relationships. I was missing uh, meaningful relationships. And so there was this battle in my, in my brain that was going on. And, and I got so afraid of, of letting everyone down. I, we, we, had, we had built this church and um, I got to a point where uh, I was afraid of it. I was afraid of you, to be honest. I was afraid that um, that I wasn't going to be enough, that the reason people, people weren't going to stick around at church because uh, I was going to say something weird. Uh, I was going to meet somebody in the, in the lobby, in the brewery, and... And, and say the wrong thing at the wrong time, or I'm going to say something wrong in the sermon. And that weight of trying to be perfect kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And recently, it, it started to get better. I realized it. I've put people in my life. Um, and then just this last week, I was chatting with a pastor friend of mine on the phone. He lives on the West Coast, and... Uh, I was telling him all these struggles that I was having, and he said, Bud, you are, you're doing math wrong. You're using the wrong math. And he said, it's not about how people view you. It's about how, are, are you preaching the gospel? Are you preaching good theology? Now, there's things we can critique. Are you leaving things open-ended? Am, um, am I preaching heresy? Those are things that we can get into, but unless 
you just preach the gospel. Know that you're doing what God's called you to do uh, and then leave the rest up to God. People don't have to like you. They, they don't have to, as long as you're doing what you have to do. And I tell you all of that because we're in this series in Galatians of Jesus and, and this verse that Paul is going to read is convicting to me. I didn't plan on just doing one verse today um, until a couple of weeks ago and when I read this verse and I was like, oh man, that needs its attention all on its own. Now maybe this is just for me, I don't know, but I think there's something for all of us. Um, so far in this this series of Jesus and, Paul has Uh, really called out the church in Galatia. Uh, There were Jewish people coming in alongside of him, behind him, and saying, you've also got to be circumcised. There's a whole list of things for you to do. It's grace and all of these other things that you have to do. It's Jesus and. It's not just Jesus, but there's a lot of other things that you need to do if you want to be considered a Christian. And so Paul gets really angry, and he writes to the churches in Galatia and uh, so far, he's he's given them a double damning. Uh, he's he's actually said an angel can go to hell if they don't want to uh, just preach a gospel. If they add anything to the gospel, then it's then it's a damnation for for anyone. And so uh, that's what he just gets done talking about. And then in verse 10, this is where we get our verse for the day. Now we're going to go into some other scripture, but as far as Galatians go, one verse. And this is what Paul says, and this is what cut me right to the heart uh, the last couple of weeks. Verse 10, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? (laughs) right? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So Paul is saying that, guys, I'm not afraid of you. Am I, am I preaching to, to, for the approval of the people that are around me? Or am I preaching the gospel for God? Am I seeking the approval of man or of God? And that is the question that I've wrestled with since the beginning, ever since high school, ever since I was a little kid. Am I seeking the approval of man or of God? And it's manifested its way itself in so many different ways in my life. But that is the turmoil that's inside of me. and, And there's no other way that I can describe it except turmoil. I struggle with this more so than anything else. As your pastor, you need to understand that, that um, that this is a struggle for me. I think it's important for us to be vulnerable with one another. I think it's important that we're transparent with one another as a church saying, listen, these are the things that I'm struggling with. Now, I don't give you all of this information on myself. I don't be vulnerable and transparent with you guys so that you can feel sorry for me, so that you can judge me, so that you can critique me. What I'm doing is I'm trying to do this. I've got people in my life, okay? I have people in my life that will hold me accountable, that are holding me uh, to, to what I say, to a standard that I need to live by, and, um, and, and just know that I have those people in place. What I'm trying to model is transparency and vulnerability. And Paul here says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? And that cut me to the quick because this is the struggle. Some, some, some had accused Paul of giving him a gospel light message, of, of preaching a gospel light message. And so he's like, he's saying, I'm, if I'm still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I'm still trying to please man, I would not have double damned anyone who says anything contrary to this. He's not seeking the approval of man anymore. He said, if I were still trying... He didn't say if I were trying, he said if I were still trying, which means at one point he was trying to seek the approval of man. It was back when he was a, he, he was a Pharisee, when he was uh, the, the top of the top. Now we're going to get into his story next week, and I don't have time. I've got to keep going for this. Basically, uh, there's one question that I want us to ask, one question only that, that we need to ask ourselves, and it is, what am I seeking? What am I seeking? 
We're all seeking the approval of something. Now, for me, it just happens to resonate with this verse, and that I'm seeking the approval of man. I want people to like me, but we are all seeking something. We're all seeking the approval of something. I want to read that verse again. And, and at home, if you're watching this, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Write this verse down, but instead of the approval of man, write down whatever it is that, is, that, that you're struggling with to gain approval, okay? So it goes like this. For am I now seeking the approval of underline, whatever that is, um, uh, uh, and write maybe in the margins, if you've got room in your margins on your Bible, or if you've got some, some, some notebook paper with you, write down whatever that, it, that word is. For Am I now seeking the approval of work? Am, am I now seeking the approval of money? Am I now seeking the approval of my spouse? Am I now uh, seeking the approval of friends? Am I now seeking the approval of society, uh, culture, um, my, my boss, all of these different things. Listen to that again. For am I now seeking the approval of blank or of God? Oh, so now it's not just cutting me anymore, is it? Now it might be cutting you a little bit too. Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I now seeking the approval of wealth or of God? Am I now seeking the approval of culture or of God? Am I now seeking the approval of um, uh, whatever that, that word is or of God? Or am I trying to please use that word? If I were still trying to please whatever that word is, I would not be a servant of Christ. So again, friends, the question is, what am I seeking? Now, you don't answer it for me. Answer it for yourself. What I already told you what I'm seeking. We can't serve two masters. Jesus says it in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate one, hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now he was talking about money here, but it goes much broader than that. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and man. Now under money, if you want to write, you cannot serve God and do a, a, a blank and write in that word. You cannot serve God and blank. You can't do it. Too many times we, we keep going back to this. We keep going back to uh, this, little, this little wheel um, and, and, and trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to find approval from. We, from. we try to find fulfillment in all of these different things. And I think we, we, we start to see the effects of, of seeking anything but Jesus. Now we're going to get to that in a minute, but we're gonna, we, we start seeking anything but Jesus. We start to see the effects of that over time. And there's some pretty rough statistics out there. For the state of, of the uh, American mind right now, for those of us that are watching this in America, there's a couple, of, a few different countries. I don't know how you heard about this, where you got it from, or why you're here, but thanks for being here. I don't know how translations work, but I hope you're, you're catching all of this. Um, anyway, there's, there's effects of seeking anything but Jesus. And in the United States, I looked up some of these stats, and I think there's a lot of correlation between the two. Now, the, di the, the difficulty in this is saying, oh, if because of this, then this, um, it's not as black and white as, oh, here's the cause, here's the effect. I think it plays a lot into our seeking anything but Jesus, our finding our worth in anything but Jesus. I, I think it plays a big, big role in our mental health. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that I don't just say, if you struggle with depression, you need to seek Jesus more. I believe that's true, but I don't think it's always the simplest way. I think sometimes we need to seek Jesus and medication sometimes help. Uh, with anxiety, you know, uh, Xanax does a pretty good job if you need it for a while. But the first question is, am I seeking Jesus? Okay, to the stats. So church membership in the U.S. has hovered around 70% ever since the 30s. Ever since the 1930s, church membership has been about mm, 70%, give or take. It's gone down to maybe 68, up to 73, but it's always kind of fluctuated right around there until 1999. In 1999, it started to take a downward trend. And since 1999, you guys, it has dropped dramatically now in 2000, I think this was a study in 2019. It might have been 2021. I should have written the date down. There is only, uh, it's dropped to 
from 70, 73% all the way down to 47%. Church membership, people who uh, regularly attend a church, they call that their church home, they're members of that church, is now the minority in America. I don't know if I can't stress that enough, that this is now a minority. If you find yourself in church all the time, you belong to a church, you are now in the minority of belief systems in the United States of America. Where you're over, before you were the overall majority, you are now a major major uh, minority. Now, in that same time, mental health, since 1999, mental health has skyrocketed, or, or should I say, mental health issues have skyrocketed. You, you look at every single metric, whatever metric you can look at since 1999, uh, and you see all of it just exploding, and that doesn't even take into account the pandemic. All right, so this, a lot of the studies were before in 2019. Up until 2019, 2020 was its own animal, and since then, it's been its own animal. But since then, every single metric has gone up. Suicides have gone way, way, way up. I think it's uh, the number two cause of death between under the, for people under the age of 40, like 17 to 40, something like that. The high, or, or number two, I'm, again, I might be com not completely wrong, but I might be off by one or two. Suicides have gone up. Depression has gone through the roof. Anxiety has gone up. Uh, fear of missing out. This, this think of, I, I need to go here. I need to do that. That skyrocketed. Loneliness has gone up. And there's also this other thing called social media that started, which has helped push this thing along. Hasn't cured it. It's made it worse. Social media does not connect us. It makes us more separate. I don't care what Facebook tells you or Twitter or Twitch or uh, all of the other ones. I don't know what they are. Instagram, okay? Uh, and I know there's more. I don't know what they are, okay? I'm not cool. Um, in that same time, though, that since 99, that has become the prevailing theme is that we are more disconnected than ever. We are sadder than ever, more depression, more anxiety, more loneliness. And wouldn't you know, church attendance has also dropped because we're seeking other things. And stop me if you've heard this before. Oh, goodness, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy. Life is so busy. I have, I have no spare time anymore whatsoever. Uh, there's, there's, I'm, I'm going from this thing to the next thing, and then I go to bed, and I'm still thinking about stuff. And busyness, we're just so busy, right? Everything is, is, is always going. I think busyness is a symptom of seeking the wrong thing. If I'm seeking the approval of man, which is my issue, I will not stop until every person feels connected. I will send out text messages. I will send out emails. I will send out, I will make sure I get hangouts times in just so that people feel connected and don't leave the church. I can make myself as busy as I want to be, and it's a symptom of seeking the wrong thing. Busyness has become a status symbol. We wear it like a badge of honor. It's like this, oh man, oh, they're, they're an important person. They're so busy. And it makes sense, right? At least a little bit to us in our little lizard brains that it makes sense that, that we would equate busyness with success. Because if you're a, if you're a, a builder, right? Just say you're a, a construction worker of some kind and you own a company. If you're not busy with your construction company, then something's wrong, right? Right, that's the metric we use. If you're not busy all the time with work, boy, you must not be a very good carpenter. You must not do your job very well if you're that, if you have that much free time. So we equate busyness with greatness. But here's the deal. This busyness thing is a lie. I, now, before you throw something at me, well, try, try. You're just gonna hurt your TV. Um, before you throw something at your TV and ruin it, there are people who are actually busy, but overall the trend is that we are not as busy as we think we are. Some of us don't manage time very well. Some of us um, 
are trying to do too much and multitasking at the same time when we don't need to. Think about this. Uh, if we're, if we're, we're, we're always connected, we always have, um, and I use this for a timer, but we always have our phones next to us, don't we? So that we can keep going through, oh man, I'm so busy. I've got my phone. It keeps dinging. It keeps ringing. It keeps, I keep getting emails. I keep, and so at dinner time, let's just say at dinner time, we've worked a 40 hour work week. Let's just pretend that everybody works 40 hours and, uh, you get home and, and, and then um, when you sit down for dinner or maybe while you're getting ready for bed, you're checking your email, somebody's messaged you on Messenger or sent a text message to you. Um, all of that, maybe it takes 10 minutes or so, but it takes you out of whatever frame it is that you were doing, whatever you were doing and puts you back into that. And then you get mindless doing that. You keep scrolling, you keep doing whatever. And pretty soon an hour has gone by and you don't know where the time has gone. We get so quote unquote busy because we multitask and we're always connected. What happened when there was no internet, when there was no cell phones, when there was nothing, all there was was just a little rotary phone and the television and the newspaper. We're not busier, we're just more distracted. And, and, and we wear this as a, a, as a badge of honor, this busyness thing. So if we say we're not busy, then oh, he must not be doing a very good job of what he's doing. Because what will someone think if I'm not incredibly busy? There was a time when busyness wasn't that way. There are English studies that show that we are not more busy, and one of them even quotes an 1840s philosopher who, um, who, who was talking about turtle walking and how uh, people, if you were, the less busy you were, the more prestige you had. And so they would walk their turtle because it showed how much time they had. Wow, that guy must be really important because he's walking a turtle right now on the, on the sidewalk. Maybe we should all adopt that. I don't know. But we have this idea now, so what will I think? What will people think if I'm not incredibly busy? That's what my problem is. What's someone gonna think if I'm not incredibly busy? You know what that tells me? I'm seeking man's approval. I don't think busyness was in Jesus' description of what it was to be a follower of Christ. Uh, when, you, when you look at Jesus' life, when you look at what he did and what he did for us, what are the top maybe three or four things that you would talk about Jesus? Um, forgiving, loving. Man, he had a lot of grace. Uh, he seemed like he had time for everyone. You know, he didn't, but he used his time wisely. He spent time alone. He was, it never seemed like he was in a hurry. So what are the top four things people would say about you? Man, they're incredibly busy. They must be stressed. People always assume I'm so busy. I hear it all the time. Brian, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Guys, if there's anything I've done well, it's managed my time for the most part now to where I don't make myself busy. If I don't have time for you, I'm gonna feel really, really bad, but I'm not that busy. I don't think you want a busy pastor and it makes me feel guilty because I'm seeking man's approval. I've got a few points to go. So we've asked the question, what am I seeking? Paul says, am I seeking man's approval or God's? So we know the answer. We need to seek Jesus. We need to seek Christ. Jesus and nothing else. And if you want to see your life change, start seeking him. Because seeking Christ makes us look like Christ. Is that shocking? It shouldn't be shocking. Seeking Christ makes us look like Christ.
It makes us look like Christ. It, it, we, we get to look like Christ. The more we seek him, the more we look like him, the more we seek him, the more we become like him. The more we seek Christ, the more we look like Christ. It's a pretty simple thing. It, we talked about it a little bit last week. Whoever you follow, that's who you're going to start looking like. If it's your boss, if it's a society, if it's a culture, if it's, um, if it's a, a parent, if it's somebody else, your friends, you're going to start looking like them. So if we are seeking and following Jesus, we are going to look more like like Jesus. And that's important because here's the thing. Seeking Christ is going to do three, well, it's going to do more than three things, but I have a list of three things because as a pastor, you can't do more than three. The first thing, seeking Christ creates contentment. The antidote to busyness is contentment. And this is something that I've been struggling with for a really long time. If I'm following Jesus, then being continually busy doesn't make any sense. If I'm following Jesus, then being continually busy doesn't make any sense because I'm not content with something. Now, I'm throwing a blanket statement on there. I know there's a lot of people who have very busy lives, but that's a choice. Busyness is a choice. I'll wait for your email. I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait for that message. Listen, we need to learn to be content. And if we're seeking Christ, it's going to create contentment because Jesus said, seek first the treasures of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. He says it in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things, what things? Everything else is gonna be added unto you. Whatever you need, whatever those desires are, they're gonna be, they'll come later, okay? If we seek Christ, if we seek first the kingdom, we will have contentment. Paul writes it to the church in, in Philippi. He says it in uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 11. And we have a very, 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 very famous verse that we're going to get to here. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He's talking to the people. Uh, remember, the church in Philippians or in Philippi, they were very gracious. They gave a lot to, uh, to Paul in the ministry. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So what's the secret? I'm glad you asked. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Oh, wait, we've read that verse before. I can be content because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We get our contentment from Jesus. So if we're seeking Jesus, we're going to find content, contentment. Okay, I gotta keep going because we are way out of time. Uh, we're not out of time yet, but we're going to be in just like nine minutes. So, uh, But it, seeking Christ creates contentment. How many of you guys just... Oh, you long for contentment. <laughs> Seeking Christ creates contentment. Seeking Christ disrupts the busyness of life. Because you're going to find out the things that are important. Write a list down. What's important to you? And, you're gonna, and then make a list of all the things you're doing and seeing how it adds up. See how it adds up. Seeking Christ is the key to contentment. Seeking Christ impacts those around me. Listen, I'm, if I'm seeking Christ, if I want to make an impact, this is for me personally, I get to continually preach the gospel. I continue preaching the gospel. Seeking Christ impacts those around me. I don't have to worry about people's opinions or if I'm liked because I know if I'm seeking Christ, I'm going to look more like him because seeking Christ makes us more like Christ. And so uh, with the people that need it, I'm going to look like Christ. And so people are going to follow that. Some people are going to hate it and some people are going to follow it. But I don't get my identity any longer in, the, in people. I get it in Jesus, or at least I try to. <laughs> I don't have to worry about people's opinion or if I'm liked. Following Christ means that I'm going to impact those around me. Uh, one of the greatest stories. And, and this doesn't mean that we, we, we be a jerk to people, okay? Because what Paul is saying here in, in, in Galatians 1 is, you know, he's got that opinion uh, or people have that opinion of him. And he's saying, am I seeking man's approval or God's? Now, that doesn't give us license to be a jerk to everybody around us. Like, well, I don't care what people think about me. All I care about is God. 
But if we're following Christ, we're going to look like Christ. And yes, there are going to be some, some feathers that we ruffle. But Jesus was never a jerk just to be a jerk. There was always purpose behind it. And he was never a jerk. People took him the wrong way, obviously, because he was crucified. But he was... I, what I'm worried is that this is going to give us a license to just be like, oh, you're going to have to deal with that, not me. I can say whatever I want, be whatever I want, do whatever I want, because I'm, I'm just following Jesus. I don't care about anybody else. Paul focused, and he says, it, I believe it's in, um, I don't remember, it's in one of the letters. He says that he is still trying to please people, but not at the sake, for the sake of the gospel, not at the... Um, I said that wrong. He is trying to please people, but not at the cost of the gospel. There we go. He's not doing it at the cost of the gospel. So if we're seeking Christ, we're going to impact people around me. And I look about the, look at the example of Jesus with the woman at the well, as far as like making an impact on someone. And this is a model for us and, and necessarily, not necessarily how to do it, but look at what Jesus did and, and see the clues of what he did. And maybe we can take something from that. He, he immediately built a relationship with this woman. All right? If you don't know the story, this is a woman who um, Jesus was, was, was hot and needed to sit down. They were going through, uh, they had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. And he sat down by this well, which happened to be Jacob's well back from Genesis. We, we did that a little while ago. Uh, Genesis, he, uh, Jacob's well that he had given to his son Joseph. Anyway, it's called Jacob's Well, and so Jesus is sitting there, and then it's about it, heat of the day, which is not the time you come and draw water, and this woman comes up to get water. Why? Because she doesn't want to be around all the people. She doesn't want to be around all these people who are judging her, condemning her, because she's got a little bit of a history, a little bit of a past in this town of Samaria, and, well, word gets around. And so she goes to, to fill up her water uh, at the, at the well and, and Jesus sees her, he's there on purpose. And, um, he asks her for a drink and she's like, why are you asking me for a drink? And he's saying, man, if only you knew who I was, you would be the one asking me for a drink because I have living water. And she's like, you don't even have a pail. What, what, what well are you drawing living water from? Tell me about it. And is it better than Jacob? Are you saying that this is better than Jacob? Because this is Jacob's well, buddy. And so they start having this conversation and he starts telling her about this living water that she can have. And she's like, tell me how to get this living water. And so he tells her and then he says, hey, go home, tell your husband uh, and, and get your husband and bring him up back over here. And she's like, I, I don't, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. When you say you don't have a husband, you've had five. And the guy you're sleeping with right now, the guy you're shacking up with right now, not your husband. And so she's immediately blown away by this, that he knew all of these details about her, but there's compassion in the way that he calls her out. There's, there, there's compassion. So he saw her need, that she had been going to the wrong thing to fill up something in her life. She was seeking the approval of men, quite literally, in this. I don't know why. I don't know what her background was, but she was seeking men's approval for some reason. And Jesus just calls it out and says, what I have for you is living water. I know you're not filled up. I know you feel empty. I know you're still thirsty. Come to me and I will give you a drink. And then you'll never be thirsty again. Jesus saw her need, calls out how she was trying to fulfill the need, and she followed. Jesus had compassion on her. Listen, the story doesn't go, uh, she comes up and Jesus starts berating her for who she is and that she doesn't look anything like him, that she's got her life all messed up and I don't care what you have to, I don't care what you think about this. I don't care what your opinion is. I'm right and so I'm just gonna speak the truth, whatever that is that's gonna make you feel. He has compassion. He identifies with her and then uh, finds finds something that they have in common. teaches her, shows that he has interest in her, and it changes her life. And if we're seeking Christ, we're going to have those impacts with people around us. Some people might label you a jerk. Some people might label you something. But for the people who need to hear the gospel...
you're going to be the closest thing up to this point that they've ever gotten to Jesus. If we're seeking him. And I think right now a lot of us are the furthest thing to Jesus that people have ever met. Because we're seeking so many other things. We're not seeking Jesus. We're seeking the approval of whatever. And this is for me personally. Man, I need to find my identity in Jesus Christ. Lastly, seeking Christ directs my steps. If I'm seeking Christ, he's going to direct my steps. He's going to give me the people to talk to. He's going to put me in the right positions when I need to be in them. He's going to direct my steps. And he's going to put me in positions that I wouldn't typically think of myself as being in. Uh, <laughs> pretty much all the time. And, and this is where I really need to, to hunker down um, and, and get this through this thick skull of mine. Because here's the deal. Seeking Christ directs my steps. Now, if it were up to Brian, I said this last week live in the brewery. I don't think I said it online. I, I said, I, you know what? I don't really like people. I don't like being around people. I don't like talking to people. The after service and before service thing, not my favorite time at all. And so I don't necessarily want to be friends and have relationships with everyone. While that's incredibly true, it's not right. Um... And, and, and I don't need to be friends with everyone. I don't need to put that pressure on me. But what I do need to do is build relationships at least a little bit where I can be a pastor. And now if I want to be a pastor, I need to let Christ direct my steps, which means I need to step out into uh, the brewery with people and get to know people, shake hands with them, whatever it is. So I'm just letting you know that uh, if you come to the brewery, you're at church, I'm going to do my best to be following Jesus, let him direct my steps and try to carry on a conversation with you, even for just a few moments, because that connection is important. Christ is going to grow us. Our faith is going to be growing, growing. <laughs> our, our faith is going to be growing because of our following Jesus. We follow Jesus. We uh, seek Jesus. We become more like Jesus, and our faith grows because he puts us in, in unique and vulnerable situations and places where we never, ever, ever thought we were going to be. How many of you actually thought you would be um, going to church in a brewery if you show up? Not very many, right? I mean, it wasn't really on the top things on your list of things that you were going to do, but here you are in a brewery. Jesus, he, he shouldn't have even been talking to this woman at the well. It, th there's no reason that he, he should have talked to her. She was from Samaria. Jews and Samaritans did not get along. There's a parable about it. You might have heard about it. Uh, the Samaritan who, uh, the good Samaritan, that's where we get that from, is from this parable. Uh, Jews and Samaritans did not get along. And so the fact that they were even talking to each other, it calls it out in, in John chapter four, like, which is where the story is found, by the way. Why are you even talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman and you're a Jewish person. We don't get along. And that's the beauty of, of seeking Christ as he directs our steps and he puts us in the paths of people where it's like, I don't know why I'm talking to you or what's going on here. I, I, just, I just know that we're supposed to be together. And I just need to make a... No, I'm not going to do it here because I, it's, it's not important for this one, but I, I'm going to say it live. I can tell you that. But we need to understand that there are going to be people in our lives that we're not necessarily going to agree with, get along with, or really like at all, but they got put into our lives for a reason. If we are seeking Christ, he's going to direct our steps and he's going to make us look more like Christ so that we can handle that situation. Seeking Christ directs my steps. It's going to make us go to places we didn't think we would ever go. It's going to make us surrender things that we never thought we would ever surrender before. 
Some of us are, are looking at this and we're seeking Christ and we're trying to seek Christ, but we're seeing what it's going to cost and we're thinking, ah, I just don't know if I can do that. Some of us need to leave our jobs. Some of us need to um, move to a different place. Some of us need to make drastic changes in our lives. Some of us need to give up some things. Some of us need to start adopting some things. Some of us need to shut up. Some of us need to speak up. That's what seeking Christ does for us and to us and in us. So what are you seeking today? Are you seeking approval of fill in the blank or God? And are you pointing people to Jesus or are you pointing it to your little G God? When you get introduced to someone in the first five minutes and they ask, tell me about yourself, what's the first thing that you say? I get that question wrong. I want to read something from Psalms. Psalm. <laughs> There's a P in front of it. If you've got a Bible, turn all the way to the middle of it and flip all the way to the very first Psalm. Psalm chapter 1. Now, there's a lot of Psalms. David wrote most of them. And um, David, he was an interesting guy. He probably would have... Um, not been fit for leadership in a pastoral position had he been a pastor, but um, God blessed him, God used him, and uh, through him, through his line, uh, we have Jesus, and that's pretty awesome. David wrote a whole bunch of Psalms, and um, I just want to read the first three verses of Psalm 1. If you want to read the rest later, it's only six or seven verses, but I wanted to focus on the first three. This is what it looks like when we seek Christ and not man and not something else, whatever that thing is for you. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now that is always the way sin goes, isn't it? Well, that's the way, the way the world works. We, we, we stand, or I'm sorry, we walk by, we see it, and pretty soon we're entertaining it. We'll stand in front of it. Now, we're not going to commit, right? We'll just stand, maybe have a conversation. Walk by, and now I'm going to stop. I'm going to stand. I'm going to give it my attention a little bit. And then that's always going to progress to sitting down with it. What are you seeking? Because you're going to walk towards it, you're going to stand in front of it, and you're going to sit in front of it. You're going to identify with it. Sitting uh, in the seat of scoffers, to sit with someone in this time meant you identified with that person. You were with that person. And so uh, this says that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We can take that as the first five books, the 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 whole um, all of it, the law and the prophets, or we can take it as all of Scripture. And for you and me, it's all of Scripture. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Oh, that's why I wanted to leave this right here. It's getting to be summertime. I'm wearing shorts right now and a t-shirt, and I've got my flippies right next to me. Those are my flip-flops. I call them flippies. And um, I love summertime. I love it. I'm looking at the forecast for next week, not really loving it as much as I was this week, but I know summer is almost here, and I am here for it. And I uh, go to a lake, and, and man, I love being by water. And you see these huge trees that are right on the riverbank or on the lake bank or whatever, and they're just these, these ginormous trees, and it's just a beautiful tree. And, and David is saying, be like this tree. It's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. 
Underline that, in its season. See, a busyness lifestyle, we're trying to produce fruit in every single season. But like a tree, you'd only do it when you can. It's in its season, when it's time, when it's necessary. Don't try to force anything to happen, but in its season, it will bear fruit. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now, that doesn't mean health, wealth, and and, and, and um status, uh, prosperity. This is prosperous. This is contentment in Jesus Christ. Those who identify their lives in Christ, those who are seeking Christ, if we are people following Jesus, we are rooted in Christ like a tree by streams of water. And you know, a, a tree doesn't have to do too much to grow. No one it's dependent on, this is going to be so cliche, <laughs> the sun that we would be more dependent on the sun. Are you ready to give up that busy lifestyle? How's your life working out for you so far? Are you feeling contentment? Are you feeling peace? Are you feeling joy? No? Let's be ruthlessly honest. As my friend Tim likes to say in, in uh, treatment programs, it's um, getting better is, is a, I should have thought about it before I started saying it, is um, rigorous honesty about where you're at and holding to the truth, holding to reality at all costs. So for the reality of where you're at right now, what or who are you pursuing? And if it's not Jesus, then we need to repent. We're no different than the woman at the well. A lot of us look at that and be like, oh man, I'm glad I'm not her. But so many of us are. Now it might not be with sex, it might be with so many other things, but we're seeking after the wrong thing and we keep going back to the wrong thing, trying to get that to fill us up. And I want to tell you right now that Jesus is here and he's for you and he wants to fill you up. When we seek Jesus, we find contentment. We impact people around us and he directs our steps. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you do indeed direct our steps and you give us contentment. God, I pray that through us we would uh, be able to be an impact to the world around us as we seek you. God, I pray for those who maybe hear this message for the first time and don't know you as personal Savior. God, I pray that they would repent of sin and uh, would turn towards you and dedicate our lives to you. Jesus, we thank you. It's in your precious name, the name in which every knee shall bow, the name of Jesus. Amen.